Well, I would say um, turn in your Bibles to uh, Mark chapter 13, but I'm not going to say that this morning because I'm going to just take a, a short pause on that. Um, and I'll just be totally honest with you why, because um, Mark 13 is, is about a lot of the end times type things and the abomination that causes desolation. And I need more than a couple days to figure that out. Um, so if you can just give me some time, just figure out the end times over the next week or so. Uh, that'd be great. I'll come back with an answer uh, in a little while. But um, I, I, I thought it, it was good to uh, just take a pause. And, uh, you know, I, 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 here, here's a question for you. And, I, of course, you just answer it in your own mind. And, and ask myself the same question. And the question, the question is this. Where do you really find your rest? Like, I, don't, I don't mean going away to a certain location for a week or two, but I mean in the midst of uh, a, a busy day or um, a hard week, you know, where, do, where do you really find refreshment? And, and I ask that question not um, to say that um, you know, maybe it's an elusive place you haven't found yet, and I'm going to tell you. Um, I, I think we kind of find it in the same place, whether I'm here as a pastor talking with you, or, or whatever it might be. And, of course, we find the best rest we're going to find is to find it in Christ and find it in the Scripture. And, and my, um, if there's one thing that you'll hear from me, you know, in, in private conversation and, and hopefully hear from the front, is that the best, the best refreshment you're ever going to get is to come really through God's Word as He speaks to you, as you hear His voice through the pages of Scripture. And I, I'm not... Um, I'm not going to guess that everybody's, you know, like found this yet. And maybe just, maybe you continue to struggle through trying to figure out how to read the Bible. Um, maybe you find your rest in, in some other way. And, and I, I acknowledge that too. But I, I, one of the things I've been praying for lately, you know, as, as a pastor, is that, that God would give me a renewed uh, joy, not simply just to read the Bible, but to read other um, other bits of theology devotionally. It's, it's one thing, I, th I think when I came, became a Christian in college, I, I devoured, um, I, started, I devoured the Bible, I started to really devour um, theological books. And I, I don't think there was much distinction between what I was doing in class and what I was doing devotionally. It was just all kind of ran together, and it was all new. I think when I got to seminary, it, it became a little bit more academic in the sense that, you know, there was so much to be read and that the level of difficulty, you know, trying to pull it all off and, and write about it and think about it and be stretched by it. You know, I think in some ways the, the devotional nature, you know, especially through theological books, I should say, is, took a little bit of a back seat. And since that time, it's, it's been for me, I think, a lot of pushing and pulling, a lot of shoving and trying to get my nose into um, good theology. Not that not I haven't read theology in 15 years, I have. But I'm, I'm coming back to a prayer request that I think God is answering for me, that, that I would just have a renewed joy in, in reading uh, not only, uh, not really the scripture, there's, there's joy there, but joy in reading other things devotionally that would help me. And I don't mean at massive levels. I just mean in bits and pieces and bites. And, and that, that joy, to some degree, has been rediscovered, um, at least in the last month or so, as I picked up A.W. Pink's book on the attributes of God. It's a short book. Um, I'd encourage any one of you to get it. Now, Pink writes with, a, with an 18th uh, century, 19th century, I should say, prose point of view. But I will tell you, I think part of the refreshment I've had is that point of view, um, and it's coming from another location, another time period. Um, but his, his, um, he, he had a section on um, the omniscience of God, God knowing everything. That has been, for me, particularly helpful. And I thought I would take a Sunday. I'm not sure how to sermonize this, okay? So um, there's not going to be a lot of cute illustrations and stuff, um, because I'm usually doing cute illustrations, but uh, it's not, it's not going to happen. Um, I, I, think, I, I think what I'm going to try and do here, maybe just by asking that question, where do you find your rest, just, just here's the idea 
for the morning. And then we're going to, I'm going to just move through a couple different scriptures. So if you have a Bible, I'm going to be in 1 John. Uh, I'm going to be in, in Psalm 103. I'm going to be in John 21 and 1 Corinthians 2. And I'll, I'll come back to it. But if, if you have, you know, your thumb in places and you have a Bible, I, I love to hear the pages turn still. Um, but 1 John, Psalm 103. John 21 and 1 Corinthians 2. I'm, I'm just going to move through different little sections here. I don't know how great I'll do at hanging on the hooks uh, with really solid uh, points and stuff, but I'll do my best. But here's, here's the idea of the morning again, that I think the, the place that I'm finding rest, and I think you can find it too, is in the fact that God knows everything. God knows everything. And I think the scripture is going to help us as we travel through various spots to, to reignite that thought and hopefully help us to find encouragement, motivation, and comfort. Okay, so God is omniscient. He is, he is perfect. He knows himself. He knows us. He knows everything perfectly. I think that's really the first point here. So, so A.W. Pink in his book, he puts the definitions, the definition of God's omniscience is all-knowing. He puts it this way. God is all-knowing. He knows everything, everything possible, everything actual, all events and all creatures of the past, present, and future. He is perfectly acquainted with every detail in the life of every being in heaven, in earth, and in hell. Now, I have also been using other systematic theology books to help me fill out this definition, and one was written by one of my old professors, Wayne Grudem, and he defines God's omniscience this way. God fully knows himself and all things actual and possible in one simple and eternal act. And, and he puts it that way at the end, especially so that we understand that it's not as if he has to run up to something in order to learn it. So if you listen to, to 1 John 1.5, that's where we're going to start here. 1 John 1.5, this is going to give us, I think, some insight on the fact that God perfectly knows himself and us. This is John writing now. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is, there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Here's the first wonderful picture and glimpse we get about God this morning. In him is perfect moral purity. Perfect in his knowledge of himself. Now just think about that for a second. God is light. God is light. There is something of a, a, a great word picture in that. I've, I've tried to wrap my head around that metaphor for a long time. And, and Pink, A.W. Pink, I'm just going to refer to him as Pink now. Not Pink the singer. A.W. Pink. Heaven forbid we quote Pink the singer this morning. Um, but, but Pink is saying, and he, and he uses this great little illustration, when you, when you turn on light in a dark place, everything is revealed. If God is light, everything is revealed in the light of his knowledge. He is perfectly and eternally aware of everything in himself, which is amazing when you think about the fact that he is infinite. I mean, that's, that's what's mind-blowing to me. I sat for a while in my office just trying to think about that, and I can't because my brain is finite. But to think that he knows himself and he is an infinite, perfect being, it's, it's amazing. So 1 Corinthians 2, if we flip over to that, you can see within the, within the Trinity, within the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the role that the Holy Spirit takes in the fact that God knows himself perfectly. 1 Corinthians 2, uh, verses uh, 10 and 11. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit, capital as the Holy Spirit, searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? 
So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. And it's just, it's just a, it's a pretty amazing thought. No one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So one of the magnificent ways you can see the interrelationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is part of the wise knowledge of God, knowing and searching everything in the depths of of God's being. He perfectly knows the past. He perfectly knows our present, present, and he perfectly knows the future. He calls us, as we think about the future, because I think this is where devotionally things start to intersect for us. You know, where, where does this have, you know, sort of devotional, real devotional teeth? And Jesus, I think Jesus is helping us in that. Jesus helps us understand that God indeed knows our total and exhaustive future and knows it perfectly. When he says in Matthew 6, 25, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not, are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, if you you take what we're, we probably all are at some level with, with thinking about our own anxiety. And you think of the perfect, exhaustive omniscience of God and what Jesus is saying here. Will it be the once for all cure for your anxiety? I, I don't know. But will it be, I think, a helpful remedy to to buffet against the waves of anxiety that continue to come in your heart and your life when you think about maybe the most basic necessities that God has already promised that he'd provide and to think that he knows of that providence well in advance. He's known for all eternity and he's promised to give exactly what you need when you need it because he's perfect in every way through his knowledge of you. You know, I think about the lilies of the field. I think about the dandelions in my grass. Totally predictable. This is the week where they make their entrance. Of course. Of course. See, we, 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 we live in a world that's both predictable and unpredictable. And yet God knows everything. He comprehends it all. And amazingly, in in his um, comprehension, in in his his knowledge of everything, he's gracious to us and he gives us insight. He gives us, he reveals to us, he reveals to us certain things about himself and about the world. Certain things that, he knows unto himself that we will never know. And he knows that there are certain things about him that we will and are supposed to know. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, 
but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Isn't it amazing at the end of the law that that's the, one of the things that the people of Israel and one of, the, one of the things that we get to understand, that the secret things belong to God, that there are things that God is going to know because he is supreme sovereign over everything. And there are things that we are meant to know because he's revealed them to us. And one of the most important things that we could ever receive are the words of his commands that are found in the Bible. That if we are ever going to grow in wisdom in our own sense of knowledge, that we are going to grow first by understanding what he says here. So one of the things that um, John Frame picks up on in his systematic theology that I had the privilege of being confused by and, and I think enlightened by this week is that there, there is a, a, an important correlation uh, between the, uh, the omniscience of God and the omnipotence of God and that the omnipotence of God being he being all-powerful and all-knowing. That if you understand his all-powerful authority over the universe in your life, that his uh, omniscience, his, his all-knowing will make a lot more sense. But if, if, if you don't understand that, that's, it's going to be very hard for you to understand that there is going to be certain, only certain things revealed and given to you because your reason and your knowledge is not the be-all, end-all. But it's very hard to understand the concept of his and really grasp it if you've rejected the fact that he is all-powerful that he is the sovereign over all the universe. And that's exactly, I think, the distinction and the problem that we have when we talk to people with different views of the world. Because if you've submitted to Christ, then you understand that you are not the be-all, end-all. You're not the creator of your own uh, life, breath, health, and that you're not the master of your own fate, your own destiny. He is. But you can really, truly rest in his all-knowing once you've come to that realization. You can really find rest in it. My takeaway is the same takeaway I had from last week as I think about a theology of suffering. And, I, and I've, I've come back to this often because it, it's been so helping me that if I understand that he is light, he is perfectly morally good in every way, and he doesn't have a scintilla of evil intent behind what he is doing, behind what's happening, there's no evil intent at all, that he has access to information, both eternal past, present, and future, that I don't have access to. And his knowledge is connected to his wisdom where he directs me by his revealing of his word to me. I've been helped through suffering thinking of this, that in his knowledge, he has access to more information about a plan that he has from all eternity being directed by his will toward a future goal in my life, in the life of the church, and in the world. That there is something so much more grand that I am a very, very small part of. That in all of eternity, I may have three possible scenarios for what may be happening that's causing me some pain. But he has three billion times three billion to the three billionth power, and then some about whatever it is that's causing pain. And he has it from eternity past and in our present and in eternity future. He knows everything. And while I may not be able to come up with something, I have to come back to the fundamental reality that my reason and my knowledge it is not complete and supreme. It's limited. And I have to submit myself to a God whose reason is not. His knowledge is perfect. His omniscience, his all-knowing, is my comfort, is my comfort when I'm confused. This is second point, if I could put it this way. Job 23.10 reminds us, he knows the way that I take. He knows the way that I take. When I take a path and I don't even know why or how I got there, I don't know where to turn, I can rest in the fact 
that he knows where I am and can guide the way to safety. You know, it, it amazes me. <laughs> the, like the world of, of, of Google Maps and GPSs and everything else. It, in a way, it's almost impossible to be lost unless your phone dies. And you truly are somewhere where you don't know where you're going. But I, I found in going to certain locations now, certain areas, several different times over that the, the paths that I've taken because of Google Maps is, is always slightly different. It's, it's almost like the cloud or whatever controls it is, is just saying, I'm bored doing it the same way every time, so I'm going to take you a different route. And um, I have a, at least one child in my family who understands how routes go and will point out the fact to me that we're not going the right way. But I, I think it's, I, I just think it, it, it just is, a, it's amazing. You know, there's a limitation to all that. But there is no limitation of the fact that God knows and comforts me in that he knows, he knows the way that I take. Because not every way is going to be, of course, a driving directional way. It's going to be a, a moral way. It's going to be a, a, a family way. It's going to be a relational way. And there are, there are times where we get to the end of ourselves and we say, how did I get here? And we come back to Job. He knows the way that I take. In times of, of weakness, David reminds us from Psalm 103. He knows our frame. And he remembers that we are dust. And this, this is, a, again, I think where I had a, a thumb, to, maybe to direct you, a, a thumb in a passage. Psalm 103 it is one of those places where, again, his omniscient care for us is a comfort, especially when we realize that we are completely weak. Beginning in verse 10, this is the context, I think, of what I just read in verse 14. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. This isn't simply about our physical frame, which we often pray about. But it's also the spiritual, mental, emotional frame that's touched by our own iniquity, our own sin. He knows the weakness that we have, weaknesses. He, he knows our triggers. He knows what causes some of our own behaviors. And the comfort that we can find in this, that as a perfect parent, he eternally and deeply cares for us in our weaknesses as much as he knows that we are weak. I'm going to say that again so we don't miss it. As a perfect parent, he eternally and deeply cares for us in our weakness as much as he knows that we are weak. So it isn't simply his knowledge of the fact that we are weak, frail, frail children of dust, but he cares as much as he knows. And then we get this picture. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us, which we sing a song at the end of that saying, hallelujah. Because there is something in his infinite span, his omnipresence, that there is no place where our transgressions will be brought back up to us if we've been forgiven by the blood of his son. We take great comfort in the fact that he deeply cares for us in our weakness as much as he knows that we're weak. His omniscience is our comfort in times of doubt. So we make our appeal, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. When we doubt, he searches us. He knows us. 
when we've come to times of failure. Pink says, when our actions belie our hearts, when our deeds repudiate our devotions, our devotion. When we betray and have sat down in abject and utter failure, we can go back to an exchange between Peter and Jesus on the beach at breakfast time and be reminded of the fact that he knows everything. John 21, 17, famous interchange at the end of Jesus' time on earth with Peter. He said to him a third time asked, after asking him twice about his love, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I, I love this interchange, and I've brought it up before. It's, it's, I think it's one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. Because here, here, is, here is Peter. He is exasperated. He's confused. He's embarrassed. After everything that had happened in, in Christ's death and resurrection, and all of what had been promised to the twelve, Peter decides he's going back out fishing again. <laughs> And for, what, for whatever reason, he's doing this now, but he sees Jesus on the beach. He's, he's like swimming now to get to him. Jesus is cooking breakfast. And, and then this, this, this interchange comes around breakfast time. And Peter, what I love about him is that he gives us insight as to how we think about the omniscience of God. But because at the end of your failure... When you've gone back to what you're doing and maybe you've forgotten about God for a while, when you've been exasperated and confused and put on the spot, Peter, Peter finally comes to the end of his rope. And, and it's not about resting in his own knowledge anymore. Or even trying to communicate to God his own emotional conviction. At this point, he just says, you know that I love you. And you know everything. And I find such comfort in this. Because it's like after all the things that maybe have been said and done through the course of my life, and I can't come up with anything else to say, all I can say is, God, you are omniscient. You've known my convictions. You've known my faith. I cannot rest in whatever emotional response that I might use to undergird some feeling that I have for you because maybe, frankly, it's not there. But you know that I love you. And I rest in that knowledge. And so Peter here, after all that betrayal, has to rest in the knowledge that Jesus has of him. Of what he believed before his fear took over. The things that he had done before he cowered and ran. Jesus, you know my convictions. You know my actions, good and bad. I, can, I can't rely on my knowledge anymore. My quotations of your words anymore. I just have to rest my failure in your knowledge of me. And Jesus graciously gives him a commission. Feed my sheep. Because he's, he's gracious. He's a, he's a God of favor. Of humility. And he knows that he has a grander plan with an utter failure. And he's going to continue on with that plan. It's a wonderful interchange. His omniscience is my comfort and failure when I'm confused, when I don't know the way that I take, in times of doubt, his omniscience is my encouragement to pray and confess. How can he hear and respond to so many conversations and requests all at once? This is the question that a child may ask. How does Jesus hear every single prayer all right at the same time? Well, because he's not like us. Not good enough. Billions of thoughts, words, and groans every nanosecond of every day, perfectly understood because he has a perfectly infinite mind. His infinite mind is capable of paying the same attention to billions as if only one individual were seeking his attention. Hard to, hard to grasp. He's not like us. Isaiah 65, 24, It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. 
and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Some people may struggle to pray because they, they say, why tell God something if he already knows it? Why ask of him for something if he've already, he's already understood my need? The best thing I can say, like a parent, <laughs> he delights that his children come into his presence and bring it. Because in that they recognize a certain level of dependence, a certain level of trust, a certain level of intimacy. That in all the places that you could go to meet your own need, you go to him. In all the affections that you could ever have for other people and other things and other circumstances that you could go to, you go to him. And there's a delight that your heavenly father has when you realize, when you realize that. It's one thing to receive a few bucks from a distant relative that you don't really talk to. It's quite another after talking, laughing, crying, tantruming, whatever, when you find a gift on the table or something is taken care of and you know it's come from a loving place. Your Heavenly Father knows exactly what you need and he's delighted when you come into his presence to seek it out directly from him. When I'm fearful of the events of my life, and the events of the world. I remember Psalm 147.5 that says, Great is the Lord and of great power. His knowledge of the future is vast and complete, and he knows every future contingency and possibility. No pundit can tell you what's going to happen with world events and world leaders and what people may or may not do. There's no use getting anxious about it, even though that may happen. Daniel 4.35 he knew something of crazy leadership. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among his inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his agency, his hand. Proverbs 19.21, there are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. Think about it. There are many devices in a man's heart. There are, there are many different ways people may make decisions that will impact us. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. That's what we claim here in the 21st century. Counsel of the Lord. And when I consider then that he is both omniscient and omnipresent, when I think about my own life, my own prayer, and my own confession, then I know that there is really nowhere I can turn that's outside of his presence and his knowledge. Think about it. This is from Herman Bovink. I had to pull Bovink off my shelf. He didn't get a lot of love in my library. When I was in seminary, he got a lot of love. You know, it was ways of impressing your friends. Since he's been on my shelf as a pastor, he's been looked over a lot. But he got some love this week. Went back to, uh, to, to, to old Herman here. And he had, he had something really good to say, so I want to share it with you. He says, when you wish to do something evil, you retire from the public into your house where no enemy may see you. You remove yourself even in your room. You fear some witness from another quarter. You retire into your heart, but there you meditate. Yet God is more inward than your heart. Wherever you have fled, there he is. From yourself, whither will you flee? You will not follow yourself. Will you not follow yourself? And then he says this, But since there is one more inward than even yourself, there is no place where you may flee from God angry, but only to God reconciled. Will you flee from him? Flee unto him. So helpful when you marry together an omniscient God with an omnipresent God. 1 John 3.20 says, For whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts, for he knows everything. Who is more interior to you than yourself? Answer, God. Who is in the depths of your soul more than you? God. You cannot go anywhere. You cannot flee anyone. 
You cannot go any place. He is not there. And that's what old Herman was talking about. When I confess my sin, I confess my sin with the understanding that God is greater than my heart. That there's no place where I can flee him. And if I understand that I've been forgiven, it's not unto an angry God, but to a God who seeks to reconcile me. And that is such a helpful thought. That he is greater than my heart. That there is no argument that I could make. No place that I could go. That he hasn't already been. And knows where I go. So, this isn't closing here. No cute conclusion. But even as he has seen our pain, he knows it too. I... I just know that God's omniscience has been a a particular encouragement to me lately. And I guess what I'll just end in saying is, thank you for listening to what God has been teaching to me. And hopefully at some level, it's an encouragement to you. Let me pray. Father, you you are a, a, a good father. You know our anxious thoughts. You know our frame. You know that we are frail children of dust. And we thank you because the scripture reminds us, teaches us, that as um, Luther told Erasmus, that our thoughts of you are too human, that we confess that we don't often enough come back to your scripture to have our minds expanded and enlarged. But as we've done so this morning, Lord, we pray that you'll help us to find comfort in how uh, amazing and infinite you are, especially in what you know. Help us, Lord, to rest in these things as we come before you now. And we sing uh, a final song. Help us to cheerfully sing because you know us so completely and thoroughly. Help us to submit our lives to you in the knowledge of that fact. In Jesus' name, amen.